Okay, so today we will start an explanation course of Kansky book. Today we will continue our course and we will start in the conjectiva chapter. Okay, uh, Dr. Saina, can you read please from here? Uh, the, conju the conjunctiva is a transparent mucous membrane that lines the inner surface of the eyelids and the anterior surface of the globe. Terminated at the corneoscleral limbus. It is richly vascular, supplied by the anterior ciliary and palpebral arteries. There is a dense lymphatic network with drainage to the preauricular and submandibular nodes corresponding to that of the eyelids. It has a key protective role, mediating both passive and active immunity. Anatomically, it is divided into the following. Okay, let's see then just the introduction. So it's a transparent mucous membrane. This is number one. And it's important. So it lines the inner surface of the eyelid. So the inner surface from the eyelid and the anterior surface of the globe. So you can see above the spiral and the capsule, you will see the conjunctiva terminating at the cornea scleral limbus. So here, this is the cornea scleral limbus. We have the anatomical limbus and the surgical limbus. So it will end at the cornea scleral limbus. It's richly vascular. This is very important because when you touch the conjunctiva, especially the vessels during the surgery, you will see the bleeding. And you should be careful where you make the cutary, where you make the injection where you make the cutting. Supplies by the anterior ciliary artery and the palpebral arteries. Okay, this is in the anatomy, I think it's clear. There is dense lymphatic network, and this is important. So one of the question in the basic science question, where is the lymphatic network? So the lymphatic network, it's present in the conjunctiva, not other part of the eyes. And this lymphatic network, it will Drainage to the periauricular area and also to the submandibular nodes. Like this is like the base. We have here the ear and here the periauricular area and also the submandibular area, the, the, the another the another part. So the, the left side or the lateral side it will go to the periauricular lymph nodes and the medial side it will go to the submandibular lymph nodes. Okay, mm -hmm. I think this is okay. a clear corresponding to that of the eyelids. The same thing of the eyelids, the lateral part, it will go to the periocular lymph nodes and the medial part of the eyelids, it will go to the submandibular nodes. It has a protective rule. This is very important, mediating both passive and active immunity in our body. So what is the parts? They are the palpebral, cornicial, and the bulbar conjunctiva. Please continue. The palpebral conjunctiva starts at the mucocutaneous junction of the lid margins and is firmly attached to the posterior tarsal plates. The tarsal blood vessels are vertically orientated. The fornicial conjunctiva is loose and redundant. The bulbar conjunctiva covers the anterior sclera and is continuous with the corneal epithelium at the limbus. Radial ridge at the limbus forms the palisades of locked, the likely reservoir of corneal stem cells. The stroma is loosely attached to the underlying tenon capsule except at the limbus, where the two layers fuse. The plica similaris, semilunar uh, fold, is present nasally, medial to which lies a flesh nodal caruncle consisting of modified cutaneous tissue. Okay, actually, I will show some pictures from the Google. This is what I like during my explanation. It could make the things very easy. And I will explain on the pictures and from the video. So, Parts. So here, this picture is very nice. Here we can know exactly the name of the part of the conjunctiva. So 
this area that you will see it always the white in the area we call it the bulbar conjunctiva that cover the pear sclera here or it will cover the femur capsule over the sclera the bulbibral conjunctival that it will cover the, the tarsal plate okay so it's like behind uh, or it will be disappeared behind the eyelids so here the tarsal plate it will be covered by the bulbibral conjunctival and here the part around the limbus we call it the limbus conjunctival and we have also the pornicial part at the fornix and we have four fornix inferior medial and lateral and superior medial and lateral fornices and the part that cover this area we call it fornicial conjunctival this is in a single word now from Kansky so the bulbibral conjunctiva start at the mucocutaneous junction of the lid margin so as we see in this picture so it will start at the mucocutaneous junction this is the mucocutaneous junction here it present here mm -hmm. at the lid margin okay so this is from okay. here and it will extend it until here we call this area of the bulbibral conjunctiva okay? okay so this is the bulbibral conjunctiva so and it's firmly attached to the posterior tarsal plate this part, the tarsal plate has the posterior and the anterior this part is the posterior part of the tarsal plate and this part is the anterior part of the tarsal plate. so it's attached to the posterior part of the tarsal plate we will talk about it more detail in the neuroplastic chapter the tarsal plate vessels are vertically oriented in the pelvical projectile I think this is a clear. For the furnicial conjunctiva is loose and redundant. Let me show a picture for you. For this. Okay. Mostly at the fornix area. So here this part between bulbar and bulbibral. Here they said this is the fornix. It's the loose part and redundant. Redundant. That you can see the redundancy here and the redundancy or redundance here. This is the pornicial part, and also it covers all the pornicial part. Here, another picture. I think it's it. Good. So, the bulbar conjunctiva covers the anterior sclera, as we mentioned, and is continuous with the corneal epithelium at the limbus. So, here. The first picture of the black. This one. So here it will cover the sclera and it will continue with the, the same epithelial layer of the cornea. This is the bulbar uh, conjunctiva. Radial ridges at the limbus from the palisid of Vogt. And this is very important. The palisid of Vogt. Mm -hmm. These are the cells that are present at the limbus. These are the cells, they are responsible for regeneration of the epithelial layer of the cornea. And always we should look if this layer, the palisade of book, if there is ischemia there, if there is chemical pain, it will be damaged. And when it will be damaged, the corneal ulcer, it will be continuous without healing. The likely reservoir of corneal stem cells. So what is the palisade of book? They are the reservoir of corneal stem cells. The, the, the place or the cells that are responsible to save these stem cells that will still make regeneration of the corneal epithelial cells. The stroma is loosely attached to the underlying uh, femur capsule. So we have the conjunctiva. Conjunctiva, it, it forms from mostly three layers. We have the epithelial layers of the conjunctiva. And in the middle, we have the stromal layers in the underlying tissue, or the, you can see it, the endothelial layer. So the stroma is loosely attached with the underlying you know, capsule behind the conjunctiva, except at the limbus, where the two layers fuse. So at the limbus, there is a fusing between the conjunctival and the tenon capsule. They are fused together at this area. We have the plicus semiurinaris and the carunculus. So the plicus semilunaris is present at the nasal side, medial to which lies a fissure nodule. We call it the carancal consistent of modifying cutaneous tissue. I think they are here. This is the plicus semilunaris, and this is the carancal. Okay. 
this is like a fishy type thing. Let me show it to you again. I hope everything is clear. I try to make it more simple. But I think this is what it is. Here, the biggest luminaris and the character. This is the character, the fish in the pool. And this part area that surrounds it here, this is we call it the Pika similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let us go for the histology. Yes. Uh, the epithelium is non keratizing and around five cell lower tip. Basal cuboidal cells evolve into flattened polyhedral cells, subsequently being shed from the surface. Mucus secreting goblet cells are located within the epithelium, being most dense in nasally and in the forehead. The stroma substantia propria consists of richly vascular vascularized uh, loose connective tissue. The accessory lacrimal glands of crows and warfring are located deep within st the stroma. Secretions from the accessory lacrimal glands are essential components of the tear film. Conductive associated lymphoid tissue is critical in the initiation and the regulation of ocular surface immune um, response. It consists of lymphocytes within the epithelial layers, lymphatics, and associated blood vessels with a strong component of lymphocytes and plasma cells, including follicular aggregates. So, according to the uh, histology of uh, conjunctiva, mainly there is the epithelium and the stroma, and what we call it substantia propria. For the epithelium, so we should remember it's non keratinized epithelial, epithelial layer. Are found are around five cells layer deep. So the epithelial layer, it's five layer one, two, three, mm -hmm. four, five. And if you remember in the cornea, uh, we will explain that later on in the cornea, the epithelial layer is one, two, three, four, five. And if you will go for the detail, it will reach seven layers, the epithelial layer. So here the epithelial layer is five, in the cornea it will reach seven layers. So they are five layers. Basal cuboidal cells evolve into flattened polyhedral cells. So at the basal layer of these cells, they are cuboid, cuboidal cells. Then these cuboidal cells, it will become polyhedral. Polyhedral means it has six shape, six faces. Okay, six mm -hmm. faces of shape. This is not important very much. They will not go for this detail in the clinical. They will maybe go in the basic side. Subsequently, we shed it from the surface. Mucus secreting goblet cells are located within the epithelium. So where is the goblet cell? The goblet cells, they are responsible for secreting the mucus. They are present in the first layer, the epithelial layer, being most dense in pyronasary and in the promiscuity layer. So the goblet cells mostly they present in the inferior part of the conjunctiva, like here, this is the eye, so mostly at the inferior at this part, and also in all of the promiscuous layer all of the parts. This is about the epithelium. About the stroma, we call it substantia propria. There is richly vascularized loose connective tissue. So all of the vascularization is present in the stroma and the connective tissue is loose. There is accessory lacrimonic gland and this is important. So where is the side of the accessory lacrimonic gland that that that's treat the you know the, the any tears it has of three layers. The layers that it visited from outside is the oily layer. Okay. Then we have, and this oily layer mostly coming from the meibonian gland. Mm -hmm. Then we have the second layer that we call it the aqueous layer. Aqueous. Yeah. And this aqueous layer now I will talk about it. And from inside, we call it the mucine layer. Okay. The, the inner part is the mucine layer. So for the uh, oil parts that protect the tear, it's coming from the meconian gland mostly. The aqueous, it, it will come from the lacrimal gland that is present in the superior lateral quadrant of the eye. This is the lacrimal gland. And it will secrete mostly 
there is difference between both some books they said it from 50 to 90 percent okay and some books they said it from 80 to 90 percent of the accuracy it coming from the mean like how many counts okay mm -hmm. like a percentage and the other 10 percent it will come from the cruise and wall trade gland so there is 10 percent it will come from the accessory like the many counts and we have the inducing layer uh, the inner part of the lacrimal. We will talk about that in detail in the final. Okay, so the axis of lacrimal can, it will be present in the stroma of the conjunctiva and are located deep within the stroma. Secretion from these axis of lacrimal glands are essential component of these tear glands. Okay, then the last thing that the lymphoid tissue, as I said before, it is present in the conjunctiva because one of the basic science question of the ICO, they ask the lymphoid tissue present in which layer, so it was the conjunctiva, is it critical in the initiation and regulation of the ocular surface immune responses. It consists of these lymphocytes within the epithelial layers, the lymphatic and associated blood vessels with a stromal component of the lymphocyte and the plasma cells, including follicular aggregates. I think it's clear here, this is the picture of the histology of the conjunctiva. So it started from the epithelial layer and the epithelial layer, I said it's like five, five layers, one, two, three, four, five. Then here, this is the substantia propria or the stroma of the conjunctiva, where there is here cruise and Wolfring gland. Also here you can see the vascularization of the conjunctiva. This is very important. I hope mm -hmm. it's more clear. So what you will find in the ABC layer, as we mentioned, there is the goblet cells. Okay, here you can see yeah. the goblet cells that are present in the ABC layer of the computer. I hope it's clear. Okay, clinical feature of conjunctival inflammation. Please continue. Symptoms. Non-specific symptoms include lacrimation, greediness, stinging, and burning. Itching is a, the hallmark of allergic disease, although it may also occur to a lesser extent in blepharitis and in patients with dry eye syndrome. The visual activity is not usually affected. Significant pain, photophobia, or marked foreign body sensation suggest corneal involvement. Discharge. Water discharge is composed of a serious exudate in tears and occurs in acute viral or acute allergic conjunctivitis. Muco discharge is a typical of chronic allergic conjunctivitis and dry eye. Mucopurulent discharge typically occurs in chlamydial or acute bacterial infection. Moderately purulent discharge occurs in acute bacterial conjunctivitis. Severe purulent discharge is suggestive of gonococcal infection. Okay, I will try to find some pictures for these things, but this is very important. So start with the symptoms about the clinical feature of conjunctival inflammation. So it's not specific. So maybe the patient comes with lacrimation, grippiness. Stinging sensation, especially burning sensation, itching is the hallmark of the allergic disease. So all of these can come with the conjunctiva for allergic itching. But when the patient complaining of itching, what is your first differential diagnosis? Saina, do you have an idea? Uh, itching for allergic conjunctivitis. You should think always when the patient comes with severe itching to rule out viral conjunctivitis. I think it's more important because most of the people, they come with this discharge and there is a lot of richness. Number one, I was thinking to rule out adenoviral conjunctivitis. Also, it may also appear to a lesser extent in a nephritis and a patient with a tri high syndrome. Okay, the visual activity is not visually affected. Significant pain, photophobia, or marked foreign body sensation suggests corneal involvement. Okay, I think this is clear. For the discharge, so we have five types of discharge, and this is very common question in the exam, and they love it, especially in the OSP, but they will ask you about the differential diagnosis. So, watery number one, you should pull out number one, the viral conjunctivitis, especially the adenoviral and other type. 
number two, the acute allergic conjunctivitis. But if it's a mucoid, you should rule out a chronic allergic conjunctivitis. So acute allergic conjunctivitis, watery. Chronic allergic, it's a mucoid discharge. Now we will show the picture. Also in the dry eye, you will see these mucoid, especially like inflammatory uh, disease of the cornea. You will see this mucoid part and you will stuff it from the cornea, especially in the dry eye. For the mucobulerant, number one, uh, rule out the chlamydia trachomatis or acute bacterial infection. So chronic allergic mucoid, acute allergic watery, acute bacterial mucobulerant. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, yes, this is the differentiate. And also mucobulerant, number one, think about the chlamydia. Okay, this is number one. We should rule out the chlamydia trachomatis. They said moderate purulent also occur in the acute. So acute bacterial infection may be mucopurulent or moderately purulent. Difficult actually to differentiate between both of them in the uh, examination. You will see purulent discharge or muco, sorry, mucopurulent discharge. If it's very severe, rule out Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay, this is the most important. So mucopurulent more for chlamydia, severe purulent more for Neisseria gonorrhea. Moderately purulent for acute bacterial, mucoid for chronic allergic conjunctivitis, watery for viral and acute allergic conjunctivitis. Let us try to find some uh, picture for H1, like watery fiber. This is the theory, I think it's very clear. So here, watery discharge. Especially in the viral conjunctivitis, the right eye here is very clear. Spot. Okay. Then we will see the mucopurulent and the fiber discharge. And the media. Inject fiber discharge. So here, the media trachomatis. We should rule out it. We should think about it, especially in infants. You need that come with normal vagina uterine delivery. You should rule out these immediate traumatas that we put purulent discharge like this. Okay. And here we prepare to give them like the precise ointment or erythromycin or ointment. Okay, severe purulent or gonococcal. Is it clear? It's clear, uh, but mucopurulent uh, and purulent uh, are almost uh, same. Uh, difficult to differentiate between them, but here. Uh, Mucopurulent and severe purulent. This is like severely purulent. This is for conococcal conjunctivitis. But the color, mostly it's the same. Look here, the color, it's also yellowish. And here also, it's yellowish. also yellowish. Mm -hmm. but the main thing that we can differentiate between them, I think, by culture test. Make a swab and send it to the lab. This is how we can differentiate. Mm -hmm. Okay, let us continue the conjunctival reaction. Hyperemia that is a diffuse beef red and more intense away from the limbus is usual in bacterial infection. This conjunctival injection should be distinguished from the ciliary injection of iridocyclitis. Hemorrhages may occur in viral conjunctivitis when they are often multiply small and discrete petechial and severe bacterial conjunctivitis when they are larger and diffuse. Hemosis conjunctival okay, edema. Let me mm -hmm. explain the first two. So, uh, conjunctival reaction, we have hyperemia, hemorrhage, hemosis, and the uh, membranes. So, the hyperemia mostly, I will show a picture also from CASP. This is the, it's diffuse, okay, and it's piferate, more intense away from the limbus. It's usual in bacterial infection. So, look at it, it's more intense away from the limbus. This is picture one, this is the hyperemia. So you can see here the distance from the limbus. This is, we call it 
Hibernia and very common in the bacterial type of projectile. So there is like space between it and between the limbus. The, this conjunctival injection would, 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 should be distinguished from the ciliary injection of iridocyclitis. So let me show you that just the ciliary injection understands what they mean. Ciliary injection. So here, this is the picture of the ciliary injection. So mostly the ciliary injection is around the limbus. Ciliary injection, like, like this picture. There's also so severe injection, there is the seal around the limbus. When we said hyperemia, there is distance here, and the redness starts away from the limbus. So, this is mm -hmm. so severe injection mostly in the iridocyclitis, iridocyclitis cases. For the hemorrhage, especially the hemorrhage, you can see as subconjunctival hemorrhage due to any cause, many causes for it, and also in viral conjunctivitis. Adenoviral conjunctivitis sometimes Adenoviral. some, some subconscious hemorrhage. Also other type of the viral conjunctivitis they lead to hemorrhage. Now it's not in my mind. Especially when they are often multiple, small and discrete petechial hemorrhage. This is very characteristic for the viral. Let me show you petechial. I think in Kawasaki disease, one of them petechial conjunctival viral. This, here, this one, this is the petechial hemorrhage. This is very characteristic when I see it. There is viral conjunctivitis here, other one here also. This is come in the viral conjunctivitis. Sometimes you think there is subconscious hemorrhage, but this sub petechial hemorrhage is due to the viral hemorrhage. Okay, so this is very common with the viral, especially the petechial type. Okay, this one also here. Very tight, and when you give the treatment, it will be so. Petechial severe bacterial conjunctivitis or viral conjunctivitis, it can lead both of them to hemorrhage when they are larger and diffuse. I hope it's clear for you. So, it's large, diffuse hemorrhage, petechial in shape can come with bacterial or viral conjunctivitis. I saw mostly in viral conjunctivitis. Viral conjunctivitis. But here there is Oh. It looks like after trauma. Yes. Yes, this is the particular question. Okay, let us continue for the chemosis. Uh, conjunctival edema is seen as a translucent swelling, swelling which may protrude through the eyes. Acute hemosis usually indicates a hypersensitivity response, but can also occur in severe infective conjunctivitis. Subacute or chronic hemosis has numerous causes. Local, thyroid eye disease, chronic allergic conjunctivitis, ocular or eyelid surgery trauma, increased systemic vascular permeability, allergic condition, infections including meningitis, vasculitis, increased venous pressure, superior vena cava syndrome, right-sided heart failure, decreased plasma oncotic pressure, nephrotic syndrome. So the chemosis is the conjunctival edema. Always when you see conjunctival edema or chemosis, we call it, this is very common for the music, that means this swelling, the conjunctival edema. You will see it for, for many causes, especially after surgery, if you give subconch injection, you will see this chemosis. So this the conjunctival edema. So it's a translucent swelling which may protrude to the eyelids. Okay, acute chemosis usually indicates a hypersensitivity response, like there is pollen 
is following a hypersensitive reaction that will be as a protective response from the conjunctiva if the edema it starts and the swelling will start. But can also occur in severe infective conjunctivitis like subacute or chronic commosis as numerous causes. So the acute type mostly due to any hypersensitivity reaction due to any allergy. Okay. Sometimes also due to any infection. The subacute or chronic chemosis, it's not acute now, subacute or chronic chemosis, you should rule out thyroid eye disease or chronic allergic conjunctivitis, ocular or any eyelid surgery or trauma, mostly after eyelid surgery, I see it a lot. Increased systemic vascular permeability, like if there is allergic infection, meningitis, vasculitis, if there is increase in the venous pressure. All of these it will lead to disruption in the fluid and in the vascular, vascular system that are present inside the stroma, the substantia propria of the conjunctiva. There is superior vena cava syndrome, right side heart failure, lead to edematous. All of the uh, body starting from the legs and with the conjunctiva, decreased plasma and pressure, especially in the protein syndrome. So, this is all the systemic causes of the chemosis. But mostly you should rule out hypersensitivity reaction, infection, thyroid eye disease, trauma, or any cell shift. The stent membranes continue. Mm, Pseudo membranes consist of coagulated exudate adherent to the inflamed conjunctival epithelium. They can be peeled away, leaving the underlying epithelium intact. Yes. Full membrane. True membranes involve the superficial layers of the conjunctival epithelium, so that attempt removal leads to tearing. The distinction between a true membrane and pseudo membrane is really clinically helpful, and both can leave scarring following resolution. Causes include severe adenoviral conjunctivitis, gonococcal, and some other bacterial infection, <coughs> lignous conjunctivitis, and Steven John syndrome. Okay, this is this is very important and always there is a question how to know this is pseudomembrane or this is a true membrane. So the pseudomembrane always they can be peeled away, leaving the underlying epithelium intact. Okay, so by peeling you can remove it, but the true membrane it's like very stuck with the epithelium tissue and when you peel it you will remove the epithelium and maybe a lot of bleeding will get there. Okay, so the pseudomembrane, it's a copulative oxidative materials. It adherent to this inflamed conjunctival epithelial cells. They can be peeled away. This is the trick. Okay, leaving the underlying epithelium intact. The true membrane, it will not be left intact. When you will peel it, you will remove the epithelial cells and the bleeding will stop. So the true, true membrane, it will involve the superficial layers. The epithelial layer of the conjunctival epithelium, so that this is the cause. Attempted removal leads to tearing, so you will tear the superficial layers, you tear the epithelial layer, and you will make injury for the substantia propria, and this will end with the bleeding. The distinction between two membrane clinically is, is very difficult. That's how you can differentiate by peeling. Okay. Let us look at the picture here. So here, hyperemia conjunctival infection, as we said. So the hyperemia, when it's, there is a distance between it and the limbus. Here you can, in the picture B, you can see a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Okay, very clear. And here you can see the chemosis. You can see the corneal edema and the fluid behind the conjunctival. Uh, picture D, they said this is the pseudomembrane. So here, this is this the exudative material. Especially, the most common cause for it is the adenoviral infection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you peel it, uh, it will relieve the true membrane. You will remove and tear the epithelial layer and make some substantial propria and bleeding stuff. Okay, here there is infiltration and here the scarring. Now we will read about it. So here, the causes. Number one, as we mentioned, the adenoviral conjunctivitis. This is the most common cause. During my practice, this is the most common cause that I find it. Okay, number two, the gonococcal and some other bacterial infection. So always, this is very important. Number one, the viral. Number two, gonococcal bacteria. 
Number three, you can uh, mention the streptococcus and the Corinobacterium diphtheria. Number five, the Leginus conjunctivitis, and this has come in the MCQ basic science exam before, and the last one is Stephen Johnson syndrome. So these are an MCQ question. All of these, they lead to pseudomembrane, okay, except, so adenoviral, conococcal, streptococcus, Corinobacterium, Leginus, and Stephen Johnson syndrome, remember that. Okay, then the infiltration, yes, continue. Uh, uh, what uh, pseudomembrane uh, consists of? The, the pseudomembrane is exudated material. Exudated. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's coagulated exudate adherence material. Okay. In any okay. inflammation of the conjunctival uh, epithelium, this epithelium or what what's having these substantia properly start to to secrete this exudative material outside. Okay, over the epithelium in any inflammatory. So, like as protective response, it will go outside and it will be just collect here and sticky here. Some part of it, it is still sticky with the epithelial layer. This is we call it true membrane. If it's just sticky over the epithelium, we call it pseudo membrane. Is it clear? It's clear. Okay, then the infiltration. Infiltration represents cellular recruitment to the site of chronic inflammation. It typically accompanies a papillary response. It is recognized by loss of detail of the normal thyroid conjunctival vessels, especially on the upper lid. Okay, so the infiltration, this is very important. So this is cellular recruitment to the site of the chronic inflammation. Now we can see the picture like this. Here, this is very clear picture. This is the infiltration, okay, these are the cells it just depressed here in an inflammation and typically it combines a papillary response, okay. We have follicular and papillary response, papillary response more with the bacterial infection, follicular response more with the viral infection. It recognized by loss of detail of the normal parts of conjunctival vessels, so you can see here the conjunctival vessels at this mm -hmm. part, especially on the upper lip. So this is we call it infiltration. So this cells retractment at the area of chronic inflammation. So there is loss of the detail of the tarsal conjunctival vessels. These are the infiltration of these inflammatory cells, especially in the upper lip. There are many diseases that lead to it. And the last picture here, this is for the scarring. It's not very clear. You can see it. What is the name of this part of the conjunctiva? Here, this is the conjunctiva scarring. Very clear. This picture. What is the this part of the conjunctiva name? Yes. Uh, palpebral conjunctiva. Yes, you are right. Okay. Yes. Now we read the subconjunctiva characterization. May occur in trauma and other severe form, forms of conjunctivitis. Severe scarring is associated with loss of goblet cells and accessory lacrimal glands and can lead to cicatricial entropy. So this is very important. The causes of it, uh, number one, is trauma, always the number eight. And there is many types of conjunctivitis, also the Stephen Johnson syndrome, the scarring of hair. Uh, what happened in the scanning? There is loss of these goblet cells, as we mentioned. These goblet cells. Um, yeah. Goblet cells uh, is located in epithelium yes. and they secret the mucin, the mucus. Mucus. Okay. Yes, so they are secreting the mucus. Okay. So you are right. So here, all of the goblet cells it will be lost. Okay, in the cicatrization and accessory lacrimal gland, lacrimal gland of the cruise and wall prick, also it will be loss. And sometimes it ends with cicatricial entropy. Just one picture for the cicatricial entropy. Because it's so 
so here after this scarring of the palpebral conjunctival thumping sign so that it, it inverted inward okay, because of the scar tissue and the adhesion of the scar tissue it will pull the lid inward and it will end with superficial entropy like this picture okay here, okay. here this is the superficial entropy and the lid it pull outward not inward okay. we'll see this later on okay continue the follicles Science multiplied discrete, slightly elevated lesions uh, resembling translucent grains of rice, most prominent in the fornits. Blood vessels run around or cross rather than within the lesions. Histology show a subpatellar lymphoid germinal center with central immature lymphocytes and mature cells peripherally. Causes include viral and chlamydial conjunctivitis perino ocular glandular syndrome and hypersensitivity to topical medication. Small follicles are normal finding in childhood as the follicles in the fornis and at the margin of the upper tarsal plate in adults. Okay, I will accept the follicles now. So about the uh, follicles, so here this is very important it's follicles and the villi, how to differentiate between them, and always there's a question in the OSCVIVA exam, if RCSC Glasgow or any local exam of OSCVIVA, they bring you a picture of follicles, a picture of the villi, what is the process, how to differentiate, how you know these. So this is very common question. So here start with the follicles, it's multiple discrete, Slightly elevated, elevated lesion resembles transplant grains of rice, most prominent in the furnaces. Blood vessels run around or across rather than within the lesion. So let us go to the picture. Here, this is the follicle. So, different in shape, like the babylai, mostly we, we call the, the, the head of the babylai, it's more flat. The follicle is like it's more top, like this. So more tubing, this is follicles, more flat, this is the line. Then about the blood that come from the, it present in each, each, each dip. So the vascular core it present in the double line. I will try to find much better picture, follicles. This. Yeah, this picture I prefer it much better. So here this is this is the boy. So here this is the follicular conjunctiva. Just okay. look at the, the core of the blood vessel coming from the center and it a bit like this and if you touch the right leg. Here at the center mostly there is no blood vessel. Okay, this is one of the differential between the follicular and the babylai. So more more bloody eh, or more like red, this is you should think about uh, babylai. Uh, this here, this is the, the follicular reaction. Okay, you can see here the doom shape and you can see the reflex, the white reflex above it. And there is no blood at the top. Okay, so this is mostly you think about the viral conjunctivitis and other cause of these uh, follicular reactions. Here, this is another picture for the babylai and follicular. Size are same? No, no, the babylai mostly uh, bigger, yeah. Yeah, and flat. Depend, the babylai also they divided into more than one kind. So follicles, you should think about it, the media, toxic, toxic, viral. It's a vascular, but the double lie, a red dots of varying size, red due to simple visits. So the visits, if it isn't in the center, so it's mostly red, but the follicles, it's a vascular. And it's white nodule, filled with lymphocytes. Okay, so here, this is very beautiful picture to differentiate between both of them. Here, the cause is the media, toxic, viral. Here the cause is mostly bacterial. Number ten, it's it's uh, allergic or bacterial. 
then about the shape red dots of varying size ready due to central visit so it's red dots here it's a vascular white nodule you can see the white of the nodule and it's a vascular and it's filled with lymphocyte this is picture is very beautiful we come back to the cancer here so it's slightly elevated lesion resembling cancerous cancerous and pure whitening grains of rice most prominent in the cornices area of the conjunctiva. Blood vessels run around. So the blood vessels not in the center, it's just around. Mm -hmm. Or across rather than within the region itself. So this is why it's not red with you, it's a vascular nodule. The histology, it shows sub-epithelial lymphoid germinal thin. So the follicles is formed from lymphoid germinal thin center. This is the another differential between both of them. So in the center, there is lymphoid germinal with central immature lymphocyte. Inside this lymphoid germinal central, this there is central immature lymphocyte. And there is also other mature cells peripherally of these lymphocytes. Okay, so it's a lymphatic tissue. This is the bone. What is the causes? Number one, viral. Number two, chlamydia conjunctivitis. And this is... Uh, a common question in the exam. What is the differential diagnosis? If you see the spherical's adenoviral, chlamydia trachomatis as bacteria, also in the paranoid oculoglandular syndrome, we will talk about it later on, and any hypersensitivity to typical medication. And you should remember here that typical medication can lead to follicular reaction, also it can lead to the biliary reaction. Okay? Mm -hmm. Toxic. Uh, of this medication, it can lead to both. Okay, but here they mention in follicles. Like here, they focus it in toxic, it's more with follicular reaction. But some drugs sometimes it lead to the follicular reaction, but mostly a uh, follicular reaction. Okay, but I write one of the drugs that lead to the follicular reaction. I will check it later on. Small follicles are normal finding in the childhood folliculosis. This is a common question in the MCQ. Especially if they said you see some follicles at the peripheral uh, part of the tarsal or the bulbital conjunctiva in a child, this is normal variation. It's not a disease. And if you examine any child, you will see at the periphery of his bulbital conjunctiva, or sorry, the cornicial uh, conjunctiva, you will see a follicular reaction and at the margin of the upper parts replace in adults so in the children in the cornices and in the adults in the upper parts replace you will see the folliculosis or the follicular reaction as a normal histological finding let me show it so, until which age is normal two three years four years until 10 years i see it okay follicular mm -hmm. Reaction normal. Okay, not this, not this, not this. Here they show just the disease like this one here. The eye is white, clear, everything, and you will see some fine, some follicular reaction. Okay, so here this is normal variation also in the adult in the upper part. Okay, you will see it in most, but then how you know it's normal. The eye is clear, the patient is not complaining of anything, there is no itchiness, no tearing, no stinging okay. sensation, so this is normal. The folliculosis in the children, in the cornices area, it's normal, in the adult, in the upper part, it's normal. Then the babillary reaction, yes, in these three dots. Uh, can develop only in the palpebral conjunctiva and in the lumbar bulbar conjunctiva where it is attached to the deeper fibrous layer. Science, in contrast to follicles, a vascular core is present. Micropapillar form a mosaic-like pattern of elevated red dots as a result of the central vascular channel. Macropapillar, macro uh, lesser than one millimeter, and giant papilla, greater one millimeter develop with prolonged inflammation. Epical infiltrate or stain increase fluorescence or the presence of mucus can be present with marked activity. Lumbar papilla have a gelatinous appearance. 
Histology, histology shows folds of hyperplastic conjunctival epithelium with a fibrovascular core and subepithelial stromal infiltration with inflammatory cells. Late change includes superficial stromal hyalinization, scattering, and the formation of crypt containing goblet cells. Causes include bacterial conductivitis, allergic conductivitis, chronic blepharitis, contact lens wear, superior limbic conductivitis, and floppy eyelid syndrome. Okay, this is very important, but first uh, I want to talk about the types of rubelli. We have mostly three types. Number one, we call it the normal rubelli or just rubelli. It's from 0 to 0 0.5, okay, millimeter. This is rubelli, okay, mm -hmm. uh, rubelli. Then we have the macro rubelli. Macro rubelli mostly from 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter or we write it less than one millimeter, and the giant babylai, it's more than one millimeter, okay? And each one gives you sometimes differential or you could think about disease. So can develop only in the palpebral conjunctiva and in the limbal bulbar conjunctiva. Now you can understand where is the palpebral and where is the limbal bulbar conjunctiva, where it's attached to the deep fibrous layer of the uh, limbal area. So in contrast to follicles, here the vascular core is a present. In the follicles, we see the vascular core is away from the center. The microbabylli, so we have microbabylli from 0 to 0.5, macrobabylli from 0 0.5 to 1, and giant babylli more than 1. So it's a mosaic-like pattern of elevated red, red dots. Okay. Let us look at an picture. So, picture C can be type of microbabylli. It's not very easy. Okay. I go to the type of giant. That is very clear. Okay, so here this is the giant babylli. This one very, very good. Okay, you can see this is the giant bubble Then the micro bubble Here, this is the return. Then we go from the fiber. You can see the particular changes also. Okay, so we have, uh, as mentioned, there is the vascular core, and it's like mosaic like button of elevated red dots, results of the central vascular channel. Why it's red dots? Because of this central vascular channel. The macro babylai from 0.5 to 1 and the GN more than 1. De develop with a prolonged inflammation, apical infiltrate or staining with fluorescence or all the presence of the mucus can be present with mass activity. So how we can detect it, sometimes the staining of the fluorescence can take the apical of this babylai, staining it. Okay, sometimes you see the infiltration. Uh, at this area, so when you put the fluorescein stain, you will see it. And limbal babylai have a gelatinous appearance. Okay. The histology show folds of hyperplastic conjunctival epithelium with fibrovascular fold. The fibrovascular fold uh, here in this picture. Really picture here about the lymphocyte here, picture B. Read this picture, please. I will explain on it. Yes. His histology of conductive follicle. The histology of follicle showing two subepithelial sub germinal centers with a match lymphocyte centrally and matrix cells peripherally. Okay, let me explain this. So here, first of all, the follicles. What is the follicles? There is two subepithelial. This is the third subepithelial germinal center, and this is the second subepithelial germinal center. And in the center, this is the immature lymphocyte, this one. This is the immature lymphocyte. 
and there is mature cells periphery. Here you can see the mature cells here in the dark area at the periphery, also here, also here. So it's a lymphatic reaction or lymphocyte. Okay, continue the next one, please. please. Conjunctival macropapilla. Histology of a papilla showing folds of a hyperplastic conjunctival epithelium with a fibrovascular core and subepithelial stromal infiltration with inflammatory cell. This is not very clearly, but you can see the hyperplastic. There is hyperplasia of the conjunctival epithelium with fibrovascular core. Mostly the, the core is present in the center of fibrovascular here in the center of like this. And sub epithelial stroma infiltration with the inflammatory cells. Uh, the last picture that we said it's very beautiful one. The histology. This one here. Okay. Okay, this is the fibrovascular pole, and here this is the inflammatory cell that is present in the stroma due to the inflammation. Okay. Papilla, papilla is enlarged epithelium, hyperplasia of epithelium, or follicles, hyperplasia of lymphocyte. The follicles, it has the lymphocyte. The babylai is hyperplastic of the epithelium. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between hyperplasia and hyperplasia? When you said hyper... Uh, hyperplasia um, increase in uh, number. Uh, yes, okay. increase in the number of the cells when you said hyper... Trophy increases size. Increases the size, you are right. Okay, so, so here... Uh, there is hyperplastic of the epithelial, hyperplastic with hyperplasia, and there is the core vascular, or you see the vascular core, core in the center. Okay, so this is in a simple words. I think it's clear. So, uh, histology, as we said, again, hyperplastic from the fiber epithelium, and there is the fibrovascular core, there is sub inferior stromal infiltration with the inflammatory cells. And the last thing you will see the superficial stromal hyalinization. So the hyaline tissue it will become later on it appear. So the superficial stroma due to this inflammatory any inflammatory reaction it will end with hyalinization. Scarring and the formation of the trips containing the goblet cells. Okay, so the end stage it will end with hyalinization and scarring uh, formation. The causes, the causes is very important. Bacteria, number one. Number two, the allergic conjunctivitis. Chronic epiphytis, contact in spherot. This is very important. And many patients will come with me with contact in spherot with the reaction. Superior limbic keratic conjunctivitis and Flovey Island syndrome. So, a very common question in the exam was is the differential diagnosis for follicles? What is the differential diagnosis for follicles? For the follicles, it starts with the viral, adenoviral conjunctivitis. We can talk about the drug toxicity. Okay, we can say about the medial conjunctivitis and the paranoid glandular syndrome. Okay, these are the four differentiation, the most common. For the babylai, you should mention number one, the bacterial, then the allergic, then you should mention the bifitis, the contact in spheral, the SLK, severe lymphatic conjunctivitis, we will talk about it in detail, and the fluvi eyelid syndrome uh, due to spinous that end with it sometimes. Okay, then the lymph adenopathy. Yes, please read it. The most common cause of lymph adenopathy associated with conjunctivitis in viral infection. It may also occur in chlamydial and severe bacterial conjunctivitis, especially gonococcal and perinococcal glandular syndrome. The preauricular site is typically affected. Viral conjunctivitis tends to occur in epidemics and commonly cause preauricular lymphadenopathy. So, 
what is the most common cause of lymph adenopathy viral infection which type of viral infection adenoviral so any okay. patient come with adenoviral just go to the ear of the patient and check the periauricular lymph nodes and the postauricular lymph nodes you will see or when you just make palpation you will see the, the swelling of these lymph nodes okay many patients come to me with just adenoviral infection and they told me behind the ear there is like lymph nodes there okay. why is some mandibular nodes uh, uh is not affected i don't know but from my patient that what i see from my experience it's mostly the periodical lymph nodes but maybe it 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 uh, affects the submandibular or periodical according to the books but that what i see okay also it's not just the viral also it occur in the chlamydia trachomatis and in the severe type of bacterial conjunctivitis like gonococcal so chlamydia and gonococcal may be lead to lymph adenopathy and the paranoid glandular syndrome okay the periauricular site is the typically affected all of the patients you will see the periauricular site okay submandibular i don't know why it's not affected but they said here the most common site is the periauricular viral conjunctivitis will occur in epidemics and commonly cause the periauricular lymph adenopathy so occur in epidemics like when it affects an area with this viral so it will affect all of the people there and mostly you will find again periauricular lymph adenopathy not submandibular okay i think it's clear so here in picture b this is the a conjunctival follicles and in picture c here the macrobial line not very clear the picture and Mm -hmm. Okay, so last of it for today, let us talk about bacterial, acute bacterial conjunctivitis. Yes, please start. Acute bacterial conjunctivitis is a common and usually self-limiting condition caused by direct contact with infected secretion. The most common isolates are streptococcus pneumonia, staphylococcus aureus, hemophilus influenza, and moraxelic atrax. A minority of severe cases are caused by the sexually transmitted organized nephseria gonorrhea, which can readily invade the intercorneal epithelium. Meningococcal nephseria meningitis conjunctivitis is rare and usually affects children. Diagnosis symptoms Acute onset of redness, grit, gritness, burning, and discharge. Involvement is usually bilateral, also, one eye may become affected one to two days before the other. On waking, the eyelids are frequently stuck together and may be difficult to open. Systemic symptoms may occur in patients with severe conjunctivitis associated with gonococcus, meningococcus, chlamydia, and hemophilus. In children, the possibility of progression to systemic involvement should always be borne in mind. It's a command, but sometimes it doesn't need an acute by the immune system of the eye. But it's so sometimes it's self limiting. Because by direct contact with infected secretion, it's very important. The most common, so what is the most common infected bacteria? This is one of the secret questions. I have a secret question. So the most common acute bacteria. Focus pneumonia number two, the second focus area is number two. So, number four, the number three, the number four. So, strictly focus pneumonia and smallpox. These are the most common isolated organisms. Minority of severe cases are caused by the sexually transmitted organisms. So, if there is in the case and in sexual contact, we should pull out the next. Which can be the impact for the immunity. So, also, there is a question what you are the organism that impedes the corneal system. So, there is a word I forget it, I think it's chair. I try to answer the question of the high school exam and the local exam in Arabic world and the exam. So, see for the immediate recommend. 
פודקאסט. Signs are variable and depend on the severity of infection. The vision is usually normal. Eyelid edema and erythema may occur in severe infection, particularly gonococcal. Conductible in injection, as previously described, the discharge can initially be watery, mimicking viral conjunctivitis, but rapidly becomes mucopurant. Hyperacute purulent discharge may signify gonococcal or meningococcal conjunctivitis. Superficial corneal punctate epithelial erosions are common. Peripheral corneal ulceration may occur in gonococcal and meningococcal infection and may rapidly progress to perforation. Infodenopathy is usually absent except in severe gonococcal and meningococcal infection. Okay, so the signs, it's given that the severity of the infection. The patient is normal. The patient is disturbed and there is a lot of healing, there is a lot of protocol for the patient. So the signs I look at. Okay. Excuse, something was happened with your microphone. Okay, sorry. Is it clear now? Yes, it's better now. Okay, so start start with the signs of the bacterial conjunctivitis. The vision is normal. Eyelid edema and erythema may occur in severe infection, especially the gonococcal bacterial conjunctivitis. So here in picture A, you can see the eyelid edema. Okay, and so it's more common. So you can see here also the mucopurulent discharge in this uh, gonococcal bacterial conjunctivitis. So you can see the redness, or we call it the erythema of the eyelid, okay, with the swelling of the eyelid. Conjunctival ejection is previously described here in, in this picture, 6-2-A. 6-2-A, we see it before. of the conjunctive. If my son comes and any clear test is there, or if it's far or something. 
Okay. So the conjunctival injection, then the discharge can initially be watery mimicking viral conjunctivitis, but rapidly become mucopurulent. So when it's a start as watery, not always just think this is just viral. Sometimes the bacterial conjunctivitis start with watery, then later on become mucopurulent. Hyperacute purulent discharge may signify gonococcal or mucococcal conjunctivitis. So here by the clinical, how to differentiate this is a mucopurulent or hyperacute purulent discharge. Mostly they are the same. Look at the 64C and 64D. Like, not easy to differentiate. This is 64C. This is a mucopurulent discharge. Right? This is mucopurulent discharge. Here we call it copious purulent discharge. So they are the same, but here it's more if you if you call all of the parts, they are just one part like so, but mostly they, when you see these pictures, you should be a lot, you should rule out a lot of causes of bacterial conjunctivitis, especially the gonococcal and the chlamydia virus. Okay. So, hyperacute purulent discharge, you should rule out gonococcal and gonococcal conjunctivitis. Superficial corneal and tentacular erosion are common. Okay, the finest that happens in the epithelial layer of the cornea that will Repair corneal ulceration also is common, especially in the gonococcal, meningococcal, meningococcal, perforation. So, what is the, the bacteria that, that invade the epithelial layer of the cornea? The meningococcal and the gonococcal. And it will lead to PUK, peripheral ulceration of the cornea. And when it's happened, maybe the perforation is different. And the last thing, the name of the is usually absent, except in severe monococcal and meningococcal. The name of the nephropathy can appear in viral, it can appear in the lupus or hemorrhoids, also it can appear in monococcal and meningococcal. Yes, what about it? Let us look at the picture here. Read them and please tell us. Bacterial conjunctivitis, a eyelid edema and erythema in severe infection, diffuse tarsal and fornicial conjunctival hyperemia, injection, mucopurulent discharge, profuse purulent discharge secondary to gonococcus. So you can see that it's a discharge and the vertebral part and the cornea. Oh, the investigation. No? Are not performed routinely, but may be indicated in the following situation. In severe cases, binocular conjunctival swabs and scrapings should be taken for urgent gram staining to exclude gonococcal and meningococcal infection, gram negative kidney shed intracellular diplococci. Culture should include enriched media such as a chocolate agar or tear martin for Neisseria canaria. Polymerized chain reaction may be required for less severe cases that fail to respond to treatment, particularly to rule out the possibility of chlamydia and viral infection. Tip. Read the tip. A hyperacute purulent ocular discharge may be a sign of gonococcal or meningococcal conjunctivitis. A specimen should be taken for microscopic culture and sensitivity in order to prescribe an appropriate systemic antibiotics. Oh. So, start with the investigation. What do we need to do in an investigation? So, when we can or we should go for the investigation, number one, in the severe cases, you should go for thin ocular conjunctival swab, so it should be bilateral and scrubbing should be taken for gram stain to exclude gonococcal and meningococcal. What you will see in the gram stain, this is, this is a question come in the basic science exam, you will see the kidney shaped intracellular mucotoxin character for the gonococcal. So in the gram stain, 
PCR mostly may be required for less severe cases that will correspond to treatment. After the treatment, if there is no response to so the last choice of this PCR, to rule out of intermedia and some type of the virus. So the PCR for intermedia and some type of the virus. Hyperacute pleural discharge may be signs of monoprocal or multiprocal. Specimen should be taken for microscopy. And in the microscopy, we will make culture and Treatment about sixty percent resolve within five days without treatment. Topical. Okay, continue reading. About sixty percent resolve within five days without treatment. Topical antibiotics usually four times daily for up to a week, but sometimes more intensely are frequently administered administer it to speed recovery and prevent reinfection and transmission. There is no evidence that any particular antibiotic is more effective. Ointments and drills provide a higher concentration for longer periods than draws, but should be avoided during the day because blurred vision may fall. The following antibiotics are available. Chloramphenicol, aminoglycosides, Gentamicin, neomycin, tobramicin, hinalon, ciprofloxacin, enofloxacin, levofloxacin, lomifloxacin, gatifloxacin, muxifloxacin, bisifloxacin, microlytes, erythromycin, azithromycin, polymyxin B, fusidic acid, and bacitracin. Some practitioners, particularly in the USA, believe that chlamydial chloramphenicol should not be used for routine treatment because of possible link with the plastic anemia. Gonococcal and meningococcal conjunctivitis should be treated with quinolone, gentamicin, chloramphenicol, or bacitracin 1 to 2 early, as well as systemic therapy. Systemic antibiotics are okay. required. Uh -huh. I, I will explain this before we go to the systemic antibiotic. My voice is clear? Yeah. Okay. So, treatment here, this is very important point at, at, at this part. 60% resolve within five days without any treatment. So, you can take anything and everything that you come up with. For, for me and our country, we use combination like two products to bromice, steroid, especially for the inflammatory reaction. That much better, but you should always remember that the steroid sometimes it will decrease the immune system and it leads to immune deficiency because it's immunosuppression the drug and the bacteria it increase or sometimes it take more time. But we give it because it will help in the decrease of the inflammatory sign. So maybe it will take more time to relieve the bacteria, but it will decrease the inflammatory that and the inflammation. So here they talk about the tubical antibiotic, usually four times per day for up to a week, a week sometimes for two weeks. Uh, are frequently administered to speed recovery and to prevent reinfection and that transmission. And always we give it as also continuous as a prophylaxis for two weeks, sometimes more than that. There is no evidence that any particular antibiotic is more effective. Ointment and jelly provide higher concentration for longer period. And use the gel at mid time, it will give you good response it will stay for 12 hours, but should be avoided during the day because it's very vision So, this is why at mid time. 
So what is the antibiotic that we can use? Start with the chrome chemical amino glycoside like gentan, eumycin, tobromycin, eumycin present in the maxitol, tobromycin, tobrex, and also in the tobrex, tobromycin with, with steroids. We have it, yeah. Okay, quinolones like ofloxacin, oflox, or other type, there is a lot of generic name, ciprofloxacin, ciprox, Nivofloxacin, amoxifloxacin, mostly uh, oxifloxacin, epidemox, very, very common all over the world. The microlide, the erythromycin, mostly it's local, and the azithromycin. There is also glomyxin B present in the maxitol, and the fusidic acid, that's a lot of name for the fusidic acid, and the psilocin. Other type of the antibiotic. Uh, they said in the USA they didn't prefer the chromium chloramphenicol because of the aplastic anemia as a side effect of the chloramphenicol, and we know this, and this is an MCQ question. Gonococcal and meningococcal, we can use for them quinilone, for the type of choice are quinilone, also the gentamicin and chloramphenicol, or the citrosine every two hours, also systemic therapy. Gonococcal conjunctivitis, as mentioned, if it comes in children, there is high like high trend, maybe it will involve the systemic system. So this is why they give systemic activity. So let us read about the systemic activity. I'm going to finish this part. Yes, please. please. Gonococcal infection is usually treated with the third generation cephalosporin, such as tifriaxone, quinolones, and some macrolides are alternatives. It is essential to seek advice from a microbiologist or genital urinary specialist. Uh, Hemophilus influenza infection, particularly in children, is treated with oral amoxicillin with provolenic acid. There is a 25% risk of developing otitis and other systemic problems. Meaning the voice is not very clear, Meaning a cocal conjunctivitis, particularly in children in whom early systemic prophylaxis may be life saving, as up to 30% may develop systemic disease without treatment. Yes. The advice of pediatric and infectious disease specialist must be sought, but if in doubt treatment with intramuscular penzym. Benzyl penicillin, cefriaxone, or cefotaxim, or oral ciprofloxacin should not be delayed. Preceptal or orbital cellulitis. Uh, topical steroids may reduce carrying in membranous and pseudomembranous conjunctivitis. Irrigation to remove excessive discharge may be useful in hyperpurulent cases. Contact lens wear should be discounted until at least 48 hours after complete resolution of symptoms. Contact lens should not be worn while topical antibiotic treatment continues. Risk of transmission should be reduced by hand washing and the avoidance of total sharing. Review is unnecessary for most mild moderate adult cases. Also, patients should be cautioned to seek further advice in the event of deterioration. Statutory notification of public health authorities may be required locally for some cases. So the systemic antibiotic. There is some cases we go for it, like especially as we mentioned, the gonococcal infection, uh, and we give third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone or quinolones, or we can give it quinolones, also macrolides as alternative. Uh, and we should always uh, refer the patient for genitourinary and for systemic evaluation. This is very important. Uh, Another indication for systemic antibiotic like hemophilus influenza, especially in the children, created with oral amoxicillin with the clavulinic acid because there is 25% risk of developing of otitis media and systemic problem. So when there is hemophilus influenza, there is 25% of these children that will develop otitis media. Okay, so this is why we give amoxicillin with the clavulinic acid. So the first one for the infection, Okay, and we give cefotriaxone, third 
generation cephalus screen, the second one, hemophilus and common sense. So these are the first two indications for systemic anterior. Number three, the meningococcal conjunctivitis, especially in children, where there is early systemic prophylaxis, may be life saving as up to 30% of these patients develop systemic disease without the treatment. So if there is meningococcal conjunctivitis, the risk of the systemic involved it's 30 years. So early systemic prophylaxis is very important, life-saving. So 30 years and they have systemic disease. And if, if there is systemic disease, there is meningeal uh, focus. It will affect the meninges and it will end with meningitis. So this is very, very big problem. Okay? So here you should start with systemic. So 30 years and you will develop systemic uh, meningitis. So the advice of the pediatric and infectious disease specialist must be sold, but if in any doubt about the treatment with the intramuscular benzyl, benzyl penicillin, cefraxone, or cefotaxime, or oral cefotaxime should not be needed. So if there is meningococcus, this is a critical. You should be careful here. If, uh, if there is conjunctivitis due to meningococcal, it's actually not easy to like, recognize if you will see the bigger reaction all of the time. But if you, by culture and sensitive test, it, re it reveal an intracocal, here you should start with the benzyl penicillin. If it's not a present, you can give cefraxone or cefotaxime, okay, or oral cefroflexacine. Also, the last indication for a preceptal or orbital cellulitis, you should give systemic antibiotics. This is very important. What other treatment we should go? Tubical steroids, because it will decrease the scaring and the membrane. Uh, true membrane or the pseudo-membrane. Always we give steroids because it will decrease the inflammation. The last thing, the irrigation, especially if there is excessive discharge, okay, especially for the hyperurulent hyper cases. Contact lens wear, you should discontinue this contact lens wear at least for four, eight hours after conversion solution of the symptoms. Contact lens should not be worn while it's topical antibiotic treatment continuous because the contact lens it will become a lot of ointment about it. It will be dislodged and go out of the eye. Risk of transmission should be reduced by hand washing. So all of these protective measurements should be taken. Avoidance of towel sharing. This is very important. Review, they said here is un is unnecessary for most mild moderate adult cases. Patients should be patient to seek paper advice as the event, event of deterioration. Statorification of public health authorities may be required locally for some cases, especially if it's epidemic or if it's many patients, they are uh, the, the infection be transmitted to them at the same time. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Topical steroids, uh, what will be better? Drops or ointment for reducing membranes? Uh, here, both of them it will work. Which one is much better? The much better thing is healing of the membrane, not giving the steroid. Because the problem with the pseudo membrane or the membrane, it, for, it will make like a protective layer for the virus. So here this mm -hmm. is the membrane and the virus particles behind it, it's hiding it. So you give the steroid, you give an antibiotic, you give all of the treatment, okay, it will not work, okay, because the virus, like there is a shield around it and it will protect it. So the best thing for the membrane, when you see it, just peeling it, remove it. When you remove it, okay, so all of the particles of virus now, it will be shed with the peeling, or it will be very easy when you give the eye drops, it will reach and it will make its action. So, tubical or ointment, the difference between them, the ointment it will still for long period, like if you give ointment, it will still for five or 12 hours. The eye drops, mostly we give it one, one by four give the maximum power. The ointment you can give it one by two, it will equal for one by four for the item. So it's just depends on the duration. So the ointment it will still for more long area, but sometimes it's sticky for the patient. He is or she is annoying from the feeling of the ointment. 
and all of these things. But the most important for the membrane is peeling of the membrane. Mm -hmm. You will remove the particles of the, the media trachomatis or the viral, and it, you will let the eye drops or the ointment to reach and make its effect much better because it make a protective area. It will not lead to these drugs to reach uh, the proper site for the its action. Is it clear? It's clear. Okay. Thank you so much. This is the first lecture in the conjunct five. Inshallah, we will continue in uh, the next lecture, the giant form syndrome.